New Orleans is often called the city of the dead and one of the reasons is because the cemeteries resemble actual cities or small homes where the dead are buried above the ground and it's also one of the most haunted cities in the country. Several ghost hunters believe it's the most supernatural city in the United States. St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 is considered a paranormal hotspot and is said to be haunted by hundreds of ghosts. The cemetery dates back to 1789 and is known as the most haunted spot in the city. The cemetery covers an entire block and there are over 700 tombs and 100,000 people are buried in the cemetery with more being added every year. The city itself is said to be sinking at an estimated rate of 3 inches per 100 years as well as all of its structures. So when the walls of the cemetery were constructed, they were 3 internments tall. Now they're about 2.5 internments tall in some places as you can see from this picture. It's also the oldest cemetery in the city today and it's often seen in movies and it's famous for its amazing neoclassical architecture. The layout of the tombs and the mausoleums and the ghost stories and the famous people that are buried there. The most famous tomb is number 347 and it's the tomb that is believed to belong to the mysterious Marie Laveau Perry. I say believed because we don't know 100% that it is hers. She was supposedly buried in her husband's family tomb that's on the left in this picture. On the right is a different tomb that people often mistaken for hers and her ghost has supposedly been seen walking around the cemetery and they say if you try to follow her she just vanishes. The tomb that's believed to be hers was vandalized in 2013 and was painted pink with latex paint and it was damaged some during the restoration. There's a legend which is responsible for a lot of the vandalism of her tomb and it says that she will grant you a wish if you make an X or multiple X's on her tomb, turn around three times and then knock on the tomb. The people doing this, they think that they are practicing voodoo but they aren't. They're vandalizing someone's tomb. Once the X's were removed, it wouldn't be long before the tomb was still full of X's again. The tomb had to be cleaned off every few months because of this. And as you can see from this picture, tourists liked to touch the tomb for some reason so that gives it a dirty look. The wish spell ritual has been unfortunately popularized by some in the New Orleans tourism industry. More voodoo is said to be practiced at this tomb than any tomb in the US and most people who practice voodoo and genuinely live it as a lifestyle have never left a mark on the tomb. And because of the repeated vandalism, public viewings are no longer allowed. You have to purchase a ticket and have a guided tour in order to see inside of the cemetery if you aren't a family member. People were also breaking into some of the tombs and they were littering and even camping out in the cemetery. Marie Laveau volunteered to help the sick during the yellow fever epidemic. She mostly helped slaves and free men and women that had the disease. The yellow fever epidemic returned every year with a vengeance. Just about every major city in the south was a breeding ground for yellow fever in the summer because it thrives in warm humid places with dense populations. The disease spreads by mosquitoes but that wasn't known at the time and during the first day or two of contracting it there aren't really any symptoms. The next phase of yellow fever is called the acute phase and common symptoms are headaches, muscle soreness, fever, loss of appetite, vomiting, and dizziness. During the next phase, also called the toxic phase, the person experiences extreme pain, delirium, seizures, hemorrhaging of blood from the nose, eyes, ears, fingernails, or even through their toes. They also become jaundiced because the virus attacks the liver, hence the name yellow fever. Right before the person dies, they vomit partially coagulated blood. The virus is also called black vomit because of that particular reason. At this point, the blood looks like coffee grounds and they say it feels like it too. Of the people who contracted the virus, about half would die from it. And the worst year on record in New Orleans was 1853. By late July, about 100 people every day were dying. Over 4% of the city's population, or about 5,000 people, died from yellow fever in August alone. Eventually, New Orleans was given the nickname Necropolis or City of the Dead 
And in a span of a century, over 40,000 people in New Orleans died of yellow fever. There is a story that says a former slave named Olivier Blanchard from what is now St. Martin Parish remembered a woman who was about to get married, but she got sick a few days before. She died and was quickly buried. When her body was later disinterred from the underground grave to be placed in a tomb, it was discovered that she had been buried alive and had eaten her own shoulder and hand away. According to Blanchard, when her fiancé saw the corpse, he went home, fell sick with yellow fever, and he too died. And there are stories of accidental life burial during yellow fever because as the person lapsed into a coma, it was possible to mistake that person for dead, especially because the time between death and interment was sometimes only a matter of hours. Multiple coffins in New Orleans were supposedly found with scratch marks on the inside. Several children and nuns died from the disease, and ghosts of the children who died are said to haunt the halls of the hotel. What I'm referring to is the Sisters of the Holy Family. It was the country's first and oldest congregation of black Catholic nuns, and in 1881, they moved into the Orleans Ballroom, and they renamed it St. Mary's Academy, which served as a school and orphanage for young black girls. The Sisters of the Holy Family has since moved to another location, and in the building is now the Bourbon Orleans Hotel. And as I said, several children and nuns died from the disease. One commonly seen ghost is that of a young girl playing with a ball on the sixth floor of the hotel. The Bourbon Orleans Hotel is among the top 10 most haunted hotels in the country. At least 20 ghosts are said to reside in the hotel many of which are the victims of yellow fever from the days when the building was a convent, as I mentioned. The ballroom is said to be the home of a female ghost that dances underneath a crystal chandelier. Several reports have been made of the rustling and a person hiding behind the drapes in the ballroom when there isn't a window open and no one is actually there. Guests have also reported hearing the laughter of children playing in the halls and some claim to feel the children tugging on their clothes. Room 644 is said to be the most haunted room in the hotel and that a nun took her life in that room. This is something that has not been confirmed nor denied by the Sisters of the Holy Family, so take that with a grain of salt. Guests and staff have reported hearing horrific screams from that room at night. And some people say it sounds like someone is being tortured. They often report being woken up by a nun that's standing over their bed in the middle of the night. There's also the ghost of a Confederate soldier that has been seen walking the halls of the hotel. He doesn't really pay any attention to the guests, but he does attract attention because he walks with a heavy limp. His clothes are tattered and he has open flesh wounds. He's often most seen on the third and sixth floors. If you're a fan of American Horror Story and you've seen the third season, American Horror Story Coven, you are probably somewhat familiar with this next particular story. The Axeman of New Orleans is the moniker that was given to a serial killer who terrorized the citizens of the city and surrounding counties from May 1918 to October of 1919. No one knows the exact number of people that he killed, but it's said that he killed six and injured six. His crimes were extremely vicious and very bloody. He killed one couple on their wedding night and he bashed the man's head in 18 times. The survivors were often unable to describe what happened or what the person looked like. His weapon of choice was usually an ax that often belonged to the victims themselves. He would gain entry to their homes in a way that had police baffled. He would get into their homes by removing a panel on their back door with a chisel. And when he was done, he would sometimes leave the bloody axe in the victim's yard. He didn't typically rob his victims or take anything from their homes, so that wasn't a motive. His motive isn't really known, but it is often speculated. The majority of his victims were Italian immigrants, so some assumed that he was attached to the mafia somehow. The victims were typically Italian grocers, and by this time, Italians owned about half of the grocery stores in that area. On March 13, 1919, three days after a husband and wife were attacked and their baby daughter killed, 
A letter claiming to be from the Axeman was published in the Times Picayune. This is what the letter read. March 13, 1919. Esteemed mortal of New Orleans, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axeman. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, besmeared with the blood of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, etc. Tell them to be aware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the Axeman. I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I feel the police will always dodge me as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, and the worst, for I am in close relationship with the Angel of Death. Now, to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I'm very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions, that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then, so much better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is, some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and it is about time I leave your earthly home, I will cease my discourse. Hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee. I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that has ever existed, either in fact or realm of fancy. Signed, the Axeman. In Greek mythology, Tartarus is described as a vast chasm, a dark place of decay. It's the lowest region of the universe. It is as far below the earth as heaven is from the earth and it was also used as a place for banished monsters and gods. The sound of music coming from the homes of New Orleans residents at 1215 Wednesday morning proved that many took this letter very seriously. On the night of the 19th, all of New Orleans' dance halls, discos, bars, and honky-tonks were filled to the brim, and trained as well as inexperienced bands played jazz up until dawn. There were hundreds of parties that night, and no one was murdered. Historians and criminal profilers, however, think that the likelihood of the actual Axeman having written this letter is exceptionally slim. On March 21st, 1788, the Great New Orleans Fire started on Good Friday and it burned 856 of the 1100 structures in the French Quarter. And during the fire, a part of Pierre-Philippe de Marigny's mansion was burned, and over the next 10 years, New Orleans was in a rebuilding phase. Pierre-Antoine Lepardi Jordan purchased the mansion from Pierre-Philippe and restored it to its original grandeur for himself and his family. Although Pierre-Antoine loved his home, he had a gambling addiction, and in 1814, he wagered his home in a poker game and he lost everything. He was so devastated by this, and he took his life on the second floor in the same area where Muriel's seance lounges are today. He's been known to move objects around the room, causing them to appear to levitate. But his ghost doesn't seem to appear in human form, but instead as a glimmer of sparkly light that wanders around the lounge. 
Patrons and employees of Muriel's have also witnessed objects being moved around throughout the restaurant. And today, there is a table that is reserved for Pierre Jourdain, and it's set with bread and wine. In the 1700s, the Catholic diocese sent young girls from the French convents to New Orleans to be wives to the French settlers so they could inhabit the growing Louisiana colony. There were around 82 men and boys settling the colony during this time. And prior to this, women were sent from jails and brothels and they were considered undesirable. As the girls from the convents arrived, they each carried a small coffin-shaped chest that contained their belongings, and they were soon known as the casket girls. The word cassette, or small chest, turned into casket over time and then casket. Once the men saw the girls, rumors began to speculate. These girls were said to be very pale, and their skin would get red and blister after they were only outside for a very short amount of time. Soon, the men started being cruel to them, and some were in abusive, unwanted marriages. Some of the girls turned to prostitution after their husbands left them, so eventually, the king demanded the girls return to France. So the sisters of the convent then took the chests to the third floor. All of the girls didn't leave the convent, so some did remain. A short time later, when the nuns went back to the third floor, the chests that the girls brought with them when they arrived in the city were completely empty. They searched every inch of the third floor and their belongings were never found. The nuns began to worry that the girls might be something other than what they said they were, so they made sure nothing would ever leave the third floor ever again. The legend of the casket girls says the third floor of the 1751 convent building was sealed off and the windows were permanently shuttered because the girls were really vampires. Some stories say the shutters were nailed down with nails blessed by a pope, but Pope John Paul II was the first pope to actually visit New Orleans and that was in 1987. Maybe the nails were sent to Rome for a blessing and then shipped back to New Orleans. Who knows? Some tourist guides will say that without the nails being blessed by the Pope, the young women would be out roaming the streets looking to feed on the blood of the living. There's another story that says in 1978, two paranormal investigators camped out in front of the convent. They had been previously kicked off the property for loitering, but they decided to stay the night and see if they could experience anything paranormal. They eventually fell asleep, so they didn't notice that the shutters on the third floor were opening and closing. Their cameras also stopped and faded to black. The next morning, their bodies were found torn open as if clawed by an animal, and their bodies were drained of blood. I want to add that many of the photos of the original small chests were made to make the caskets appear to be larger than they actually were. The small chests were made to appear like they were large enough to hold a body. So you can see how stories like this get started. The Le Petit Theater is home to about 40 known spirits, and it dates back to the early days of New Orleans. The building is actually older than the city itself. But before it was a theater, it was used for a variety of different things. One being barracks for Union soldiers during the Civil War. Witnesses say they often feel icy cold air in certain areas of the building, and people who have taken photos in the theater often capture floating orbs or strange ghostly silhouettes. The most common ghosts are the Union soldiers. They're often seen marching around through the halls, and sometimes you can only hear their boots. One soldier has been seen on multiple occasions standing in front of a wall fixing his uniform as if he's looking in a mirror. It's said that a large mirror was once in that very spot. There is another ghost. Her name is Caroline, and she also haunts the theater after she died tragically. She was an actress who was seeing one of the theater's maintenance men, and one night they decided to fool around high up on the elevated service platform above the main stage. And one thing led to another, and Caroline fell and broke her neck. She was killed instantly. She was found tangled in wiring with the curtains covering her body. The maintenance man disappeared shortly after this, leading many to believe that it may have been murder. Her ghost is often seen floating along that catwalk. And those who have seen her spirit say they immediately feel an icy cold 
breeze as if the air suddenly dropped to below freezing. And one of the more frightening ghosts is that of an ex-theater manager who took his life while sitting in the office lounge. Employees who work late nights feel as though they are being watched by his angry spirit. They'll often get chills when they're in the office lounge and sometimes they'll hear banging on the doors and drawers when the room is empty. He's also been known to steal personal belongings. A man's wallet went missing from his desk drawer one night and it reappeared on the soundboard early the next morning even though no one had overnight access to that room. When actors do lose something that may have been stolen by this particular ghost, they'll call out to Caroline and ask her to help them find it. 